27th of March. We're just uh, four days away from that glorious day of Easter. And in between, we have Monday, Thursday. And then we also have uh, Good Friday. And then we have Holy or Silent Saturday. Uh, and we're going to be looking at uh, uh, Good Friday today. We're going to be looking at some of the events that took place there. And uh, most notably, uh, where Jesus says, I thirst. And then also, we're going to be looking at the words of It is Finished. And then we're going to uh, go from there. But as we uh, gather together today, we do so knowing that our Lord loves us and cares for us. Uh, as the names populate up here, I will say good morning. Good morning there, Cody and David. Glad to have you around. Uh, just as a reminder for those that are uh, going to Bible study, there is no Bible study this morning uh, at church. Uh, certainly encourage you to do your own individual Bible study as you go throughout the day, though. Uh, again, we're going to be looking at some very, uh, very heavy things, some very wonderful things at the same time as we continue to look at uh, what our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ endured uh, both on his way to the cross and then as he was nailed to the cross and languished in that pain. Uh, Doreen, good to have you around this morning too. And uh, again, as I say, as we come on board, we'll be doing that. But whether you're joining us live this morning or whether you uh, catch us later on in, in a uh, time that is better fitting to your schedule, we thank you for joining us and for allowing us to be a uh, part of your day in uh, sharing the word of God with you. Uh, let's open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, as we enter into these last several days of Holy Week, may we do so with fear and trembling and awe and admiration. And may we look at these things and realize the depth of your love for us. And may we also see the evil of sin. And in these things, Father, to amend our lives and how we live with each other, that we would better reflect the love of Christ than the face of evil. And in all of these things, Lord, we give you thanks that you have given us the forgiveness of sins through the death and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So we pray that you watch over us now and continue to build us up into his image. We humbly pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And again, we're going to be looking at John 19, uh, specifically looking at 28 through 30 uh, as we take a look at that. Uh, but one of the things I want to do is kind of set the context uh, so bear with me as I read, because I don't want to miss anything as I wrote these things down here. But you know, so far up to this point, Jesus had been taken from the Garden of Gethsemane, judged, beaten, heckled by the Jewish people at the mock trial, then taken to Pontius Pilate's castle, interviewed by him, then taken to see King Herod for another round of interrogation. After that, he's taken back to Pontius Pilate, beaten and scourged without mercy had a crown of thorns pressed upon his head, taken out through the city of Jerusalem, up the hill to Golgotha, stripped of his clothing, nailed to the cross. And he hung there from 9 until 3 p.m., or from 9 a.m. until 3 p.m., exposed to the elements, fighting for every breath as the punishment of God was poured out upon him because he knew he who knew no sin became sin for us. It is after all of this that Jesus gives out that mournful cry, of I thirst. And the question is, why did it take so long for him to do that? And of course, it's a very powerful thing when we consider it. And I'm sure that long before then, uh, as the scriptures say in uh, uh, Psalm 22:15b, it says, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. And in Psalm 69:3, I am weary with my crying out, my throat is parched. And again, uh, a couple of scripture verses that paint a picture of the agony that our Lord and Savior was going to go through long before it actually took place. Uh, but we see those scriptures fulfilled in uh, what Jesus is going through there. And in even those words of, I thirst, uh, to fulfill that scripture. And Jesus would not do that before he knew that our sin had been paid for. It says, after this, Jesus, knowing that was all was now finished, said, and again, here's the thing, right? And it's put in parentheses, to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. And if we take that to understand that until he knew that all of our sin debt had been completely paid for, that he had endured the full wrath of God as he hung upon that cross, enduring hell itself, because hell is the absence of God. And that is what Jesus experienced on that cross as the Father forsook his Son on our behalf. So that as the father turned his back on his son Jesus and left him there bereft of any hope or help in and of itself so that his heart could be turned towards us. 
And again, that is that beautiful fulfillment of for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. You know, and so we look at that and we have that beautiful gift that comes to us through all of this suffering that Jesus endured. But he would not allow himself to take that drink before he knew for certain that he could look at us and say, your sin debt is completely paid in full. And so we look at that because earlier on Jesus was given a chance for a drink before they started to nail him. It says in Matthew 27, 33 through 34, And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink, mixed with gall, but when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And by then he was certainly thirsty, even before he was nailed to the cross. I can only imagine how thirsty he was, both in body and in soul. But he would not take that because it was mixed with something that was either going to be like a sedative or a pain reliever or some kind of a narcotic or it could have even had some poison in it that would have sped up his death. Uh, but Jesus would not partake of that because he came there to accomplish the payment of our sins, not the escaping of pain and suffering. And again, this shows the great love that Jesus has for us. They could have been spared some of that pain but he would not do it. He would, he would take the full brunt of God's punishment so that our sins could be washed away in and by his blood. And uh, that is, again, something that we really need to really focus on and to consider. When we start to wonder about whether God loves us, if we're going through some hardships in our life, we go through pain and suffering, we go through great loss. We see the plans of our life uh, altered and changed. We see... Uh, our family members going through all kinds of hurt and pain. And, and we can even ask the question, does God even know what's going on here? Or has God given up on me? Maybe, uh, maybe I'm beyond the pale of his love. But when we look at the cross, we look at what Jesus endured, that could, nothing could be further from the truth. There is no question about the depth of God's love for you, for me, and for every person on this planet. And I'll say it again, every person, no matter how horrible and evil they may have been or are, our God still loves them. And he wants them to have eternal life. I've said this several times before, but it bears repeating. In Ezekiel, twice God asked the rhetorical question, do I delight in the death of an unrighteous person? And the answer is no, he does not. And so you and I need to keep that in mind too, especially when we find ourselves questioning and wondering whether or not our God loves us, and the answer is he absolutely loves us beyond our wildest dream. Our circumstances in our life, as Pastor said Sunday, don't dictate whether or not God loves us. Those are not the markers that we use. We look at the cross. We look at the suffering of Jesus. We look at the great uh, punishment that he went through, and then his crying out of, it is finished. And again, that's a word that we... I have translated as um, it, it, it's finished in, in the word is tetelestai. And that word actually could be translated as it is paid. The debt is paid in full. And of course, that makes a beautiful uh, you know, reference to what Paul writes about in uh, yeah, Colossians 2 when he says that we had a legal indebtedness because of our sins. And of course, Christ paid that debt in full, but he would not take that drink. He would not allow himself uh, to miss one part of the pain uh, that was necessary for our sins to be paid, and he would not take that drink so that he could cry out, it is finished at the right time. And again, see what Jesus shows us of his own person there on the cross through all that suffering, that as he went through all of that, he made sure to fulfill all the scriptures, including this last one of I thirst. And they gave him that vinegar and wine mix, or well, actually wine that had turned to vinegar. They have something to drink. They put it on a hyssop branch, lifted it up to him, and he took a drink of that right there. And then he said, it is finished. And so when we think about it in those terms, it is finished. And we look at that, we can maybe say, well, that was an act of kindness on behalf of the Roman soldiers. Um, what I would say to you is, if you're really, really thirsty, don't grab a cup full of vinegar because it's not going to quench your thirst. It's actually going to make it even worse. Um, it has an acidic value to it. Uh, so any cracks or anything on his lips, uh, 
as that was put up there, there would have been additional pain. And actually it was just a way for the Romans to continue to mock him. I mean, here Jesus is nailed to the cross, helpless, hung between heaven and earth, uh, no way to, to, to come down of his own to, to keep everything going in the direction to pay our sins. And so they mock him again, even with his thirst. And that just shows the, the, the cruelty of evil. And here is the sinless Son of God taking on the sins of the world so that we could have salvation. And Satan continues his full onslaught, even to the last, mocking Jesus in those last moments by seemingly giving him a drink that would refresh him. And of course, it makes it worse. And there he says, it is finished. And so if we look at that, I want to remind you that your sins are forgiven as you live and walk by faith. And for those that don't live and walk by faith, their sins aren't forgiven. Not because they weren't paid for, but because they're not accessing the one through whom that wonderful blessing comes. And that, of course, is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, that is something that uh, I want you to take with you for the rest of your life, to know that your sins are forgiven. That Jesus went through all of this pain and suffering for you, for me, and for all of God's people. And of course, this is, he tells us that he died for the sins of the world. As I transition here, I'm going to transition over to one more screen here. And I picked this very beautiful picture uh, right here with the waterfall and all that beautiful thing because, of course, Christ, who suffered thirst on our behalf, is the one who gives us living water. And so you and I, right, we rejoice that our God loves us so much that he poured out his life, that he endured that great thirst that he uh, endured on the cross. And another thing as I was reading and doing some study and preparation for today, another thing as we look at thirst, uh, when Jesus says, I thirst, he says, think of it in the context of, I thirst to do the work of God. No matter what the cost is, no matter what I must endure, I thirst to do the work of God. May you and I continue to have that same thirst too, right? The thirst to do the work and the will of God as we live in this world, as we share that wonderful gospel message with those around us, no matter what we might face, knowing that Jesus endured hell itself so that we could be forgiven. And this shows the great love he has for us. And that wraps up my message for today. I'm going to take a look at the other screen here. Uh, Diane, good to have you along. Let's see who else. I don't want to miss anybody. Diane, we got Diane, and we got Betty Ann, and Jim, good to see you. And Edward, good to see you as well. Thanks for being here. And uh, Janelle, thank you for being here as well, and for all the others that will join us later on. I wish you a blessed uh, Maundy Thursday and a, and a holy and, and gracious Good Friday. As again, we look at that dark day where it seems like evil wins, but of course we know that the victory is coming soon, right? And of course we've lived under the cross all of our life, and we've lived under the empty tomb as we know that full and wonderful story. So may we take that story with us, as I said before, and share it wherever we go, that we might be light and salt to the world. Thank you for joining us, whether it was live today, this morning, or whether it's later on. Either way, have a very blessed and wonderful uh, Holy Week. God's blessings to you and your loved ones.